Square Ball Podcast. Hello, welcome to the show. Dan here from the Square Ball with Michael Normanton and Phil Hay from The Athletic for the back end of the week show. Uh, if you got a quick cut on the video version there, which is on YouTube, by the way, Michael, you were waving around some of your favourite products that you've used this morning. Not these ones exactly, actually, but other astonished products. Cause, yeah. um, these are just our... I was going to say the props. They're not props. They're actually full, aren't they? You're, yeah, you're itching to take them home. I will use them at some point. But uh, what, yeah. did you, what did you use this morning? Uh, the antibacterial surface cleaner because I have two 10-year-old boys who... I, I'd say the, about 95% of if it goes in the toilet. But, you know, you've got yeah. to... It's a really fair clean-up to do in the morning. Can <laughs> yep. you go in there and go... Oh. The glamour of this show... <laughs> Just oh lads, come on, try a bit, try a little bit, please. How's your aim, Phil? Um, not always great. Um, however, <laughs> astonished you're on hand to help. You just yeah. wipe yours up with your gym towel, don't you? That's right, back in, yeah, back in the bag, off we go. Which oh, that was that last week or the start of the week? I've forgotten. But yeah, we've had we've had some consternation about that, Phil. Uh, and rightly so. People yes. not happy that you've you've not washed yes. your gym towel in two years. I, 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 your kickboxing towel. I have it? to say, it has actually now been washed. Yep, it had to be after recent. Um, a recent grading session that went on for four hours. Even I thought at the end of that, this needs some um, astonished cleaning <laughs> products. Yeah, like, There's nothing worse than a crispy towel. You don't, mm-hmm. need, you don't need a crispy towel. Um, but back to astonish. The shower um, shine was the other one that was a bit more pleasant. Is your shower shiny? It is. Just me gets the sort of scumminess off it, you know. When I've been washing myself. So I'm, I'm <laughs> lovely and clean. But, you know, soap scum you pe- and that. You pair Lime scale and things. I, I can weirdly imagine Normanton being quite a perfectionist, actually, when it comes to how shiny his shower is. Um, the good thing about Astonish, by the way, who bring you this show, thank you, Astonish, for sponsoring this. Sorry about everything. No harsh chemicals, no corrosives, officially uh, certified cruelty-free and vegan. Ethical products, what we like. Made in Yorkshire. Leeds United, not cruelty-free. No. Um, and just wave it at the camera, the UK's number one mold and mildew blaster. There we go, look at that. <laughs> what a... Honestly, this show, we should be so proud of it. It's, uh, it's the back end of the week show where we can reflect on the midweek game, Phil. Um, we're freshly back from Hull. We've got Watford to come at the weekend. Uh, we need to pick a one to watch. We'll just catch up with the latest Leeds news. Spence's injury is being confirmed. It's having a time frame now. We'll have a chat about Sam Byram. Should we just uh, lead off on Hull then and, uh, and your thoughts on that? Our take on it on the match ball was kind of should have won it based on the first 60 minutes. Red card kind of flipped a switch as it always tends to do in a match, and then it all got a bit championship after that. The only thing I thought prior to 60 minutes, probably from about 50 minutes onwards, was that it was straying into this could do with a little bit of a tweak or a freshen up um, territory. But I thought they played pretty well up until that point. Ruta should have scored in the first half. Some of them almost scored what would have been quite a, a scrap good goal if that had gone in. Great hit, great save. Um, better team for me for an hour, and I think had it been... 11 v 11 and had Farker made changes at the point where it was 11 v 11 and Rodon not got sent off then I think Leeds would probably have dug three points out of that um, not an awful lot he could have done about the Rodon red card which I thought one booking was fair one booking wasn't um, but as the last half hour went on you find yourself hoping that there's going to be that sort of miraculous performance where Leeds find a winner um, with 10 players and, and dig it out but they, they got deeper and deeper they found it harder and harder to get the ball it felt like it was going to be Hull's game if it was anybody's um, towards the end and we got a fabulous miss from Adama Traore which I think on the night was fair in the sense that I think it would have been harsh on Leeds to have lost that it's yeah. right up there isn't it that miss it's not quite Varney against Southampton when, where Italy managed to clear a ball off a line, off the line but it was it was pretty good yeah the, the Varney one was a sort of weird scuff scramble thing that made it look a bit of a bit comical and almost a bit intentional um, whereas the Traore one last night when did you last see a goal where you find yourself standing going that's gone in though hasn't it he scored that he hasn't missed that everybody around us in the crowd was standing there going how on earth has he done that it was the easiest of chances it was really nicely laid on to him and by Connolly Leeds were starting to feel the pace by that point they'd been backed up for quite a while and it did feel a little bit like that might come or, or was in the post somewhere Definite bonus that it was six minutes of injury time, I thought. Um, we were expecting probably 16 to 20, something like that. <laughs> um, but as I say, I, th- I think it would have been I think it would have been a harsh result to have mm-hmm. lost that. Um, they're a decent side hole, but limited, I would have said. And again, and I've felt this in most of the games Leeds have played, I did think there was a difference in quality and ability between the teams, and I think Leeds had the better of it. And it was quite obvious, certainly in the first half, that when... Leeds mixed up the tempo of the play and and changed the tempo of their attacks. It was quite difficult to to cope with, and it did create some really good openings. And again, I think Ruta sticks that away. Leeds probably win that 
last night. And I think that's how Farker felt about it as well. Um, but he wasn't, you know, he wasn't daft in trying to pretend that they didn't get away with one without Traore chance. I guess the challenge now then, because I think with the exception of the Birmingham game, which was pretty bad all round, um, but there were reasons for that. Yeah, there were. Yeah. Um, in every other game, there has been a noticeable um, golfing quality. And I think obviously the challenge now is to capitalise on that. Yeah, the, I feel like the without having been spectacular, um, aside from the, the two wins, which were really, really good victories, and I think Millwall was the first one where you felt like they were properly routing another side, it's all been nice and steady. And I think it will feel like, I was writing this morning saying it's quite a nice sort of concrete base for Farker. They've got three clean sheets back to back, which again, not to be sniffed at, yeah, given the way it's been defensively for, for so long. It's one defeat from seven, and that was... 90th minute penalty at Birmingham I did think they probably deserved to lose that game and and you have to say you know yes that was a late goal but equally they, they got away they were spared another defeat last night by by that late late miss from um Traore so you you win some and and you lose some but I think without having can I, I was thinking last night about what um Farker was talking about prior to the game in his press conference and he was he was speaking about how it had been at Norwich um and what they did when it came to managing the the idea and the the conversation around promotion. And and he said, you know, it was never banned. We didn't feel the need to ban it, but we didn't really talk about it either. You know, it wasn't like his word was obsession, weren't obsessed with it. It just wasn't kind of the part of the daily rhetoric around the training ground. Um, But this was definitely the point of the season where it started to kick in for Norwich. He kind of swerved from a lot of questions about are you going to be sacked at the beginning of September to are you going to win the league in November? And the reason for that, if you pick through the form, is because they won 13 of 18 games and, and started to move at, at breakneck speed and, and like a train. Um, I think he would like to see Leeds become what he tends to call team of the moment um, quite soon. I think he's quite pragmatic about how this season's going to go and about whether it's going to be you know that immediate hit that, that gets them up. Um, but this was that sort of week where you kind of wondered to yourself, particularly after Millwall, could they actually do three back to back? You know, could they do Millwall? Could they do Hull? Could they do Watford? The turnaround from Millwall to Hull wasn't ideal, although again, I think they played well enough to win last night. But when when you get compromised in the way that they were by the red card that Rodon picked up, having to change the team like that and and the structure um, altering completely, it's a nil nil draw is as much as you're likely to get out of there with. Based on the first sixty minutes of the of the whole game, what do you think the key differences were between the Mill, uh, the Millwall game? And, and the whole game. Any, anything noticeable stand out for you? Well, there was certainly a difference in the way Hull played in comparison to the way that Millwall played. Looking at the the opening minutes, five to ten minutes, they were committing bodies forward Hull and they were leaving space in behind. But as the half went on, and I think this was a, a product of the fact that Leeds were starting to get a greater sense of control and, and starting to dominate. As the half went on, Hull were getting deeper and deeper, more numbers behind the ball, and, and it reverted a little bit more to the Sheffield Wednesday game where you're looking at Leeds and wondering how it is that they're they're going to get through. And I think that's why the Ruta chance was so crucial because if you score, it, it leaves Hull with very little option but to come out, particularly as time goes on. And as we saw against Millwall and we saw against Ipswich as well, one, once pl- teams and players do commit forward, that is when Farker's attacking line will be at its best and, and that's when it will do, do damage um, in behind. Um, but it, it wasn't really there Um Aside from the root of chance, they were having to be pretty creative. And I think the best move of the game really was the, the Somerville chance, I felt. Um, the, the save from Allsop, who was a debutant last night. It was a decision by um, Rossinha to change his goalkeeper. And it was a really good one because I think he was probably man of the match. Yeah, he was put in. Um, I was listening to Radio Leeds on the way in and they were saying he'd been put in reportedly because he was better with his feet. Um, than the other keeper footwork a bit better and they were trying to pass it out from the back I mean as I said last night on the um, on the match ball two days ago as we were recording this um, that uh, it felt like there was a very established pattern of trying to play out from the back they'd hit a wall or it'd break down yeah. and the ball went into the channel um, or down the line something along those lines which I, th- I thought we dealt with pretty well yeah I, I do um, I, I think that's probably where Leeds are slightly superior in that they they are good at piecing attacks together and they are good at, at, at getting from, from back to front. I think they will get better. I think they probably need to be better like that. But if Farkas right, really, that defensively, they're looking better, I would say, looking more solid. They are creating chances without it being an absolute hat full. Um, they've got enough in just about every game to, to merit winning most games. The finishing um, 
it wasn't there yesterday and, and it needs to be there. Um, but even with Ruter, I mean, I, I know people were saying he should have scored that and I think he should have scored that. But it's still, we haven't seen enough of Ruter or had enough games really to, to pass judgment on whether he is going to be clinical or, or whether he's going to be a striker who is more wasteful from time to time. But I do think he's playing well. I think he's playing well, not only in linking up the attacks, but I think some of his defensive work is pretty good as well. What did you make of Perot? Because he... We've we've had four games from him now, two brilliant ones, two yeah. where you've barely noticed him. Yeah, it's like he's, he's swinging between games where you think, I can see him as a 10 and I can see how that works and see how that's that's pretty good, to games where it feels like he's a little bit lost. Um, and that was definitely the case yesterday more so. I, I wouldn't have said he had a, a poor game as such, but he wasn't massively involved in it. Um, I don't know if he might prove to be that sort of player, you know, who just pops up from time to time, does very good things um, in moments that win you games like he he did at Millwall. Um, but it was a big call to take him off, I think. And I suspect the only quibble that I would have um, with the decisions made last night was that I, I thought fresh legs in the centre of midfield might have been a good shout at some point. I did think uh, that Gray was starting to flag. I did think that Ampadu was on rocky ground because he'd had a yellow card and I'd seen what had happened to, to Rodon. But I think all in all, um, you'd take a point from that. Yeah, it's delicate though, isn't it? You, kind of, you don't want to lose that that grip and that momentum in the midfield because coming on with new, you know, fresh legs, new yeah. legs, you're not necessarily always up to the speed of the game as we saw with Cooper at the back. Yeah, I think so. Um, and also with somebody like Ampadu, he's been so good that even if he is on a yellow card, it, it's an even bigger call to take him out of the middle. I think he has been in amongst some signings who've looked really good so far. I think he's been the best of them. Um, but Rodon too, and I can't pretend... I, I thought the second challenge for Rodon was a yellow card. I thought that was a booking. Um, but I can't pretend that I thought the first one was. I wasn't even aware that he'd been booked uh, for that first one. It, it was all a bit... Um, it came It came straight after, I think, some of those chants or, or chants at the, at the Hull end. Um, and it all happened pretty quickly, so nobody kind of had their eyes on it. But also it was a bit soft. So you weren't really aware of somebody getting taken out. When Nonto got injured in the first half, we're at a really high vantage point um, in Hull. You're, you're right up the back of the main stand. But you could see that happening and you could see the the kind of intensity of the collision and it wasn't a surprise that Nonto was um, hurt as a result of it. And you knew why he'd been hurt because you'd had your eyes on it. Whereas with Rodon, it was a bit innocuous. So although the ball was there, it didn't feel as if he'd really taken anybody out. Um, and it was a, a definite... It was a definite swell from a referee at Millwall who didn't really seem to want to book anybody for anything to a referee last night who was a little bit more card happy. As I say, I don't think you can argue with the second booking and Farker did say afterwards, you've got to be a bit more savvy. I think he was basically saying, yes, second one was a yellow card and it's the sort of thing you've got to avoid if you're already booked. I think with the first one, it's because they they seem to be breaking at pace. I think we'd had a corner from that, it, that led to it and the ref was thinking it was an attempt to stop them counter-attacking. But I got the impression that personally the ball had sort of tripped over it a bit and actually lost the way and decided to go down and, and were looking for a free kick as opposed to actually trying to get forward. There, so. was, co- there was contact there, I think, but it wasn't enough it was to warrant. Yeah. There was contact, but when you watched it back, it didn't really look like a foul at all. Um, whereas the second one definitely was a foul. There was space in behind. I think if 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 Connolly gets away from Rodon, Leeds are definitely in a bit of trouble there. So that is a booking. Um, and it, you know, e- I think easy to say it was avoidable. I think in real time Rodon has to go for that challenge and has to try and make it but he just mistimed it mistimed the flight of the ball um, wasn't happy was he when he um, when he came off but sad, you know, a sad panda I've seen him described as yeah yeah no he looked um, he looked like he'd been at Millwall on uh, on Sunday yeah <laughs> two, two black eyes but um, it's um, it's annoying for Fart that though because it means defensive changes on um on Saturday, which otherwise I don't think he'd be wanting to look at at all. It's just one game, and to be clear, you cannot appeal yellow cards. You cannot, no. no. Unless it's mistaken identity. Um, so perhaps with black eyes, you could pretend to be somebody else. Kung yeah. Fu Panda. Yeah. Uh, Nonto injury, rolled his ankle, Farker said. They're not quite sure they're just assessing that. I guess we'll yeah, get more on that on Friday. Foot, bit of a knock to it. Um, wasn't able to give us anything on that last night. Um, nothing more being said today, but we should get a um, bit of a clearer picture tomorrow I was quite surprised he came back on given tomorrow the, being today as this um, comes out by the sorry, way sorry yes yeah um, Friday yeah. Um, it's uh, it's Friday somewhere in the world It, he, it watching him ru- uh, run up and down the touchline Henry McStay the physio was saying to me just do a bit of, bit of jogging give it a test didn't look great and I think as soon as he came back on you thought this will go for five minutes and then he'll sit down at some point and he'll come off which he did um, but interestingly I think the player who replaced him Somerville made Leeds look like a better team on the night um, and was probably the pick of the players. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we were caught a little bit by the uh, 
the, the time loop last week because we recorded and then it came out and we found out in between times that Jed Spence was out for what looks like about eight weeks or thereabouts. Yeah. So yeah. that's a bit of a blow, isn't it? Given that we just seem to be building that sort of robustness in the squad and you yeah. felt like maybe just to take Ailing out of the firing line a little bit um, because he's been sort of teetering, hasn't he? He's not been awful. There have been moments where you've gone, oh, but he's been teetering. I think he's been fine, basically. Um, but the thing about Spence was last time he was in the EFL um, at Forest, he made the championship team of the year and, and is that sort of right back. And I think in full flow, we'll give you more, certainly more going forward. I think a bit more dynamism on the right. Um, the fullback areas weren't massively strong last night, I didn't think. I, I understood why Shackleton came in for Byram and we were, were asking Farka afterwards about Byram, you know, his fitness and whether or not him missing that game was a case of having to manage his playing load. And Fark said, oh yeah, it was. You know, he'd, he'd spoken to Byram after the last training session before Hull and Byram had said to him, you know, I, I don't think I'm quite right for it. You know, I don't think I'm quite right for three games in a week or two games in um, in three or four days as, as it was. Um, you tend to find that a lot of managers quite like that. There, there are some coaches who just want players to play and to play through whatever's bothering them. But I think your, your typical coach these days would much prefer that, particularly a player of Byram's age and, and experience, would say, "Look, don't play me. I don't think it's the right thing to do because they know the body and they can they can tell and read what's going on." Um, the interesting thing, and I was asking Farker this last night, was is Byram, given that you know it hasn't played much the last couple of years, had a lot of injuries, is he going to get to the point where he can actually play? three times in a week because it is a bit of a it's not a prerequisite in the championship but you, it's helpful if you can do it um, and the more players who can the better it is for, for a manager and Farker's view was that yes he can but he definitely needs to be building himself up um, having watched him at Millwall and watched Shackleton against Sheffield Wednesday and now Hull I think there's no doubt that Byram is going to be the more effective player there um, I didn't think Shackleton did a massive amount wrong um, last night but I thought if this makes sense, he looked very right-footed. Suddenly, I thought he didn't look like a left-back, which he definitely isn't. And once again, it's a kind of tough gig for him being asked to play somewhere, which is just not not his role at all. And I think I think straw poll of 100 Leeds fans plus Farker himself would probably say that you, you want Byram in there at the moment. No one's saying Furpo? Uh, no, but then Furpo <laughs> isn't fit, so no point in getting into that. Then the day ends in why. <laughs> Watford at the weekend then. Um, before we get into... 2023 version of Watford. Um, let's just quickly rewind and go back to your first day on the gig as, <laughs> as the Leeds United writer at the Yorkshire Evening Post. That was your first game, wasn't it? The no, playoff no, final. Well, it was, no, not your very first game. Uh, as no, the, 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 I had done games previously, but most of them uh, pre-season friendlies and that sort of thing. That was the first competitive game that I covered um, of, of Leeds United's, but Paul Dews was still chief football writer. So I was merely second in command as it all went down at... Cardiff's Millennium Stadium. What, what can what you what can you remember weekend. from that day or that weekend? I can remember absolutely everything. It's dead clear, but most of all the weather. I mean, it was just a horrible, horrible weekend, uh, which added to the the total dejection um, that that everybody seemed to be feeling. But I think the clearest thing is it was Demerit, wasn't it? Who scored the first goal? That corner came in, and there were two Leeds fans sat behind us, and I just heard one of them say. Oh shit! As the ball, <laughs> as the ball came towards him, and it's funny how sometimes, even before anybody's planted anything on a corner, you just know. Um, it was like that entire day, wasn't it? We weren't aware at the time because we were looking down from, and again, Millennium Stadium. I don't know how it is now, but the press box used to be really high up, so you, you didn't get like a massively clear view of faces and everything else. We weren't particularly aware of the players jumping out of the skin when the fireworks went off behind them beforehand. But I've spoken to quite a few people about that, like Rob House and um, David Healy and Robbie Blake and others who were involved. And they just said it just wasn't, just didn't wasn't feel right. right. Yeah. No, it just wasn't. It just never, never got going. I don't think certain people thought the choice team was particularly good either. But Watford just did what Watford were doing that season. They were ultra strong. It was like seven, eight out of 10 across the pitch. And yes, no shit was pretty much it. Well, I, all I can remember really from the day is just... Because the the roof was closed, wasn't it? That's right. Um, but they had the quadrants, the corners. They had the see through roof on that. I can remember some some sunshine sort of piling through in those in the four corners and just noticing how weird it looked. But just the humidity inside the stadium, mm -hmm. it just felt really hot and uncomfortable and sticky. Smoky, wasn't it? And yeah, then... and after yeah, and then after I think it was like we got the train down one of those special trains, which I think they were laid on by Man United fan as well. We we, we later discovered, which always upsets you. And it was about four, five hours on the train, something like that. I spent all that time cooped up. Um, a dry train at that I think it was 
And um, yeah, it just everything about the day felt wrong. I just did did not enjoy that one little bit. No, I mean, and, I, and, and I, if I'm recalling right, I'm going to Google it now. But I think that was my dad's birthday, also. Naively, um, when I got into the stadium or when the stadium filled up, um, there were there were gaps and not massive gaps, but there were gaps in the Watford end, quite obvious gaps. There weren't any in the Leeds end. So yeah, yeah. naively, I was sitting there going, "Surely Leeds win this," you know. Um, oh, but Phil. no, <laughs> I was all wet behind the ears. Yeah, so new to the it, job. From yeah. there on, I knew the truth. Yeah. It was. Yeah, it was my dad's birthday. Blows my mind that two players from that Watford team are still playing. Feels like such an incredibly long time ago. Ben Foster and Ashley Young. Yeah. We're in that side. Yeah. Ashley Old, more like. Hey. I mean, well, boom. Yeah. They 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 weren't short of good players, but it was a proper Eddie Boothroyd team. That was it um it just they just had Leeds number on that afternoon. Um so yeah, that was where it all started. But no, my first game was a um steady ish one nil home win over Norwich City good following stuff. season. It was yeah. all downhill from there as well. Yeah, I was looking at the uh, the the Wikipedia um, page of it all. Do you know who refereed that day? No. Mike Dean? No. Oh. 64 and a half thousand there. Heavy rain, the weather, says Wikipedia. And we know it Wikipedia was. is always right. It was. Um, what's the weather looking like for the weekend? What's it going to be like at Ellen Road? How are we going to get on? Um, I don't know about the weather. Uh, I reckon it'll be all right. I'm going to have a look at the yeah, weather. Yeah, get your, get your app up. And get me app up. While I do that, talk about Leeds Watford and tell me what we can look forward to. Yeah, um, it is going to be another tight game, don't you think? Um, I cannot see what... I, I don't think there's anything in the game so far at Ellen Road that will massively encourage anybody to come and expose themselves by being overly ambitious. I think there are some clubs, as time goes on, who will come and do that. Um I mean, if Leicester keep going the way they're going, they're not going to want to turn up to Ellen Road and especially Maresca's coach and sit deep and hardly touch the ball and hardly play. They would like to, you know, they'd like to come and, and play Leeds off the park. I always remember Sean O'Driscoll's um, Doncaster doing that with um, Dennis Wise in Leeds. Another player they were, final. They were, well, yeah, yeah, joyous memories. I mean, they were a really good team under O'Driscoll and you do get those occasions where sides turn up and just go, right, we're, you know, we're going to have our fun here and, and do. But I don't think Watford will do that on Saturday. I think it will be tight. I think they will try and make Leeds play through them in the way that um, Wednesday asked Leeds to, um, to play through them. And Without any doubt, Leeds, it wasn't Leeds that didn't have chances against Wednesday and probably should have beaten Wednesday, but they're going to have to be a bit more creative than they were. Ismail, then, their manager, it's, it's all kind of chaos ball, isn't it? Um, yeah. Is the, is the style, of, style of football. It's, it's, it's generally what he's done before. Um, but as I say, you, you would think that there'd be some pragmatism, um, particularly because of the way Farkas front four is. I, I sort of feel like anybody, any other coach who's looking at Leeds at the moment will be saying to themselves regardless of the three clean sheets, if you put enough pressure on that Leeds defence, you probably get a little bit of change out of it. I think less so since Rodon's gone into it. I really do think that that he's making a big difference and, and is helping strike next to him. And I think as time goes on, I shouldn't really say this, but I do feel like Leeds will get better defensively as time goes on. I do think there'll be a kind of consistent pattern and picture of, of improvement there. But aside from that, you must be looking at the front end of the attack and thinking... You just can't take liberties with, with that group of four. And even though you had the loss of Nonto last night, Somerville comes on and looks like the best attacking player on the pitch. And and I would have said Leeds' best player. I thought Ampadu had another really good game. Um, but Somerville was the, the kind of spark in it all and the, the guy who looked like he was he was going to create or, or make something happen. And there is a, a kind of depth of resource for Farker there. Um so it'd be interesting to see. I'd like to think that we'll get some sides <coughs> who come up and come here and have a bash because it makes for a, a better spectacle. Um, I don't think it'll be the trend though. It feels like it gives us a better chance. Weather for Saturday, by the way, looking like sunshine at lunchtime, turning into clouds in the afternoon. Highs of about 15, which I think is 60 for our uh, yeah. American cousins. So y- uh, perfect, uh, perfect football conditions. Yeah, your view was always that if it's sunny, Leeds win. Do you remember me getting to West Ham um, last year, second last game of the season? bright sunshine to begin with in London you said to me it's sunny which means that Leeds win and by the time I got to the stadium it was heavily overcast I sent you a picture and it all went south what, what score was it? go on Michael was it 4-0 Leeds? No, I can't even bloody remember it was not th- good well, West Ham yeah. it was 3-1 three, three, was it? yeah mm. Did it make me feel sad? Probably. That's what Leeds do. <laughs> I think everybody was a bit beyond sad by that point, weren't they? Yeah, um, they're mid-table at the minute, so they're 14th, uh, just one um, defeat more than us. We've got that extra point thanks to an extra draw. Um, similar sort of goal difference. Um, but they haven't um, 
they haven't lost in three games. It's drin, uh, draw, win, draw their last three. Um, it's yeah, it's, it's wildly, it hasn't quite. Yeah. It's wildly even. I was going to say it hasn't quite I'm, taken shape yet, has it? I'm very interested to know. I think the the big question I have about the championship at the moment is that I think Leicester probably are as good as Leicester are looking, and and you can base that on just the players that they have. Um, I think they, I think they'll they'll finish top two. But are Preston as good as they look? Because that is an absolutely extraordinary start for them, and and not a start anybody would have particularly called. Like 19 points from seven games is, um, you know. It's like a quarter of the way to the playoffs, um, ridiculously by the the middle of. Um, is it you, Phil Hay, saying they can't they can't fail to reach the playoffs? <laughs> shall, shall I do Preston in here and now? The funny, yeah, the, relegated the, by March. The yeah. funny thing is, when you started talking, then I, my brain just thought, yeah, they're probably going to maybe they'll fall away at some point if it levels off and land up in the playoffs. But um, I oh, think there you, you go. You've gone in with both feet there, so yeah, there you go. do, do well, continue. Well, it's, it's a very good start, isn't it? But I haven't really seen much of Preston, so I don't know if they are if they are that good. But I am. I've I've said a few times this season, it's like a baseline standard in the championship, which just seems to be for a massive number of players and a large number of clubs, pretty level, um, which makes games pretty difficult to call. But it also makes me think that because when Leeds have a relatively fully fit squad and can play Piro and can play Ruter and can play Nonto or Somerville, um, whoever else, uh, James and Anthony off the bench as well, um, that they're going to have a chance in in virtually every game they play. I, I don't really see Leeds getting turned over regularly. Yeah, I mean, that's the encouraging thing, isn't it? Looking at like Ipswich, their only defeat is, was to us. And we looked really, really good that day because they gave us the space to play in. But in terms of this, I was like, Hull didn't look great. Um, like you said, they look like a limited side, but they're kind of around the playoff places. But not, but not Bur- bad. Birmingham not were very, bad either. Yeah, is, you know, fine. Yeah, and I, mean? I don't mean yeah. that to do them down. But, but again, Birmingham were pretty toothless and, and average and they're knocking around eighth at the minute, just one place above us. I feel like the difference between the championship in the Premier League is last year you look you went into every game and you'd be like, Well, we'd really use them, 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 them and them from that side. Whereas I've not particularly looked at Hull last night and gone, Oh, we we'd love a player like so and so. Yeah. Or for or from Millwall. Like I'm I'm quite content with our team over them. There's I totally not, agree there's, with not that. The, there's not the obvious gulf in, in quality of player. We've been chatting about that um amongst ourselves, media lads, and um it is the case that you be watching every team at the moment thinking it isn't it, you don't feel like you want to be plundering each squad as they come or saying you'd have him have him we were chatting on about the time that Bellingham played for Birmingham against Leeds and you did look at him at 16 at the time I think and you just thought that's he's ridiculously good yes please um, I remember Bale coming to Ellen Road with Southampton again just going up and down pretty sure he played on the left up and down the left and just standing out an, an absolute mile and you do get that from time to time but it doesn't feel as if the division is particularly awash with that I do think there'll be people looking at Farker's team and saying it'd be nice to have none to it it'd be nice to have Piro you know others like that but equally there'll be other areas of the team where they're probably not so fast or feel like they've got either equivalent resources or, or better resources um, but it's not I think with the exception of Leicester I'm not particularly looking at the table and thinking it's wholly taken shape at this stage but we are only seven games in I was going to say one thing I noted from last night's game Wednesday's game was um, was thinking that because you've got those extra body of games you get the eight extra games nothing in the championship ever feels quite as crucial as it did in the Premier League because you know your wins are, are that much harder to come by in the Premier League as we said before, you need sort of nine to ten to to survive. So you're looking at one in four or thereabouts. It always feels like there's next week in the championship, particularly yeah. because we're kind of bobbing around up a mid table at the minute. There, there, there feels to be very little jeopardy at the moment. I think it depends on what you're going for. And Farker's right, really, to say that when uh, when he first got promoted with Norwich, it was pretty, um, you know, I don't know lackluster start would be would be fair, but they were conceding at a rate of two a game. They they were picking up less than a point a game until they got into September, which is why his job seemed to be in a little bit of trouble. But then it clicked and the penny dropped and, and the the rocket boosters turned on and they just couldn't stop winning. And I think there does come a point in the season where if you're going to finish top two, for example, or if you're going to win the title, you have to find that sort of form because that's the sort of form that's required to get you beyond 80 points, 85 points, towards 90 where you can be totally confident of, um, of going up automatically. I, th- I think I would have to look back at Steve Cooper and Nottingham Forest when Cooper came in with them um, looking more like they were going to be relegated on the basis of the initial form and, and him pushing them up to, towards promotion. It can't have taken long for that to start because it, it needs to at some point. I think if you drift and meander for too long, 
you do find that it's a, a mid-table season before you know it. But I don't think Leeds are doing that at the moment. I think it's it, it feels like there's more coming from Leeds. It's just waiting for the it's waiting for the flames to properly catch. I think, and I, I suspect it won't be long before Farker saying to himself, I, "I really want to see that happen." Our current points per game would see us on sixty-five based on the start that we've made, which is just shy of the playoffs. Looking at last year's final it's, table, it's so it's way too early to do points per game. Though, no, no, I'm just, I'm just sort of curious uh, to know where we're trending. We're trending to finish about where we are in the table, funnily enough. Yeah, um, and and I think if you're being fair to Leeds, they've probably played. Um, in a way, and, and had results in a way, and performances that probably deserve to be where they are in the table at the moment. But if, uh, given that we all thought, Farke included, we all thought it might be a fairly difficult start because of everything that went on through the summer. Um, I was digging back through some of his quotes and him saying, I predict it's going to be a bumpy August. And it was a pretty bumpy August um, in, in a lot of respects. Um, but even still, we've come out of it all right, haven't yeah, we? Yeah, and, and I almost feel like they're possibly in better shape at the moment um, than I thought they would be. That's not to say I didn't think they were capable of getting this many points, but I think they've gathered the points and they've played in a way which gives me quite a lot of confidence about what's going on with them and about the way that it's it's building. And as I say, they're always you always get to a stage where it does need to you know click and um, and catch light. But I th- I, I'd be pretty happy, I think, if, if I was Farke at the moment. Not delighted and blown away, and I don't think... I don't think Leeds are massively in the conversation about promotion at the moment because of where they are in the table, but I think it will come. Yeah, you can make a case, actually, um, based on all the games, probably with the exception of Birmingham, that we deserve to win every game we've played. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I think so. Um, probably deserve to lose that at St Andrews. I don't think... I don't think enough. so. I think 0-0 would have been fair there. I thought they had enough of the, the back end of the game. Birmingham and started to cause problems, especially on the left, um, that made you feel like if a goal was going to come, it was going to come at, at their end of the pitch. But there's massive mitigation around that. I mean, there was no non to it. You know, the, the front four, we're talking now about the front four being, you know, one of the best in the championship. I mean, it was so weak at that point, or it was so unbalanced, um, so far away from what Farker would have wanted to pick, that it was it was quite the opposite. And we all said before the game... I just can't see that attack getting anything out of this at mm-hmm. all, which it didn't. You know, there are no goals and then and the loss to that late um, penalty from Djukovic. But I think to be saying that of all the games this season, they perhaps deserve to lose one is a good position to be in. And yes, they could have lost last night um, had um, Traore stuck that away. But equally, um, well, not every bit as good a chance for Ruta beforehand, um, but a very, very good one. Just have a look at the odds. We are actually still third favourites. To go up, whereas uh, you can get you can get Preston at ten to one still. Who's at the door? <laughs> yes. So apologies <laughs> if you hear any banging or drilling or knocking. They are continuing to do work in the offices below us. And we ask you for one to watch heading into every fixture, Phil, because um, we've resurrected that from the Phil Hay show, brought it over from the Athletic show. Uh, one to watch for Watford. What eyes still on the midfield? Maybe is this where we start to see a little change, a little tweak? Because Farker said he'll, he'll do a little bit of rotation, but doesn't like too much. Yeah, I. I, we shouldn't get stuck on Archie Gray as one to watch every week, I suppose, um, even though he's going to be one to watch hopefully for about 10 or, or 15 years. Um, I, I think I, I'm interested by left back really because I think Byron comes back in. Um, keen to see the difference again that, that he makes. I think given that with Shackleton, you feel like you've got a sort of steady pair of hands there, but not a... Uh, you know, not an obvious answer, if yeah. that makes well, sense. Well, he's not the natural fit there, is he? That's yeah. the thing. Yeah. Um, and that's no criticism of Shackleton. I mean, he's not in any way grown up as a as a left back. It's quite a specialist position, to say the least. Um, difficult position to fill, as Leeds have found when they've actually tried to sign left backs, let alone, you know, in, in actual fact, sometimes when they've redesigned midfielders as left backs as they did with Dallas, it's been better than, than what else has been on the books. But... Philpo hasn't played for a, a while now. Um, I, we'll find out tomorrow exactly, uh, press conference exactly where he's at. But I mean, it's, you wouldn't expect him to to be coming in for that. Um, Byron comes back in. I think Byron will make a difference again. I think the more Byron can play, the better Leeds will be. And Cooper back in, obviously, at centre-half. He's going to have to be, I think, yeah. yeah. So he's, uh, I mean, is he likely to be on that side? Because both him and Strauk are lefties, aren't they? Um, I would think so. Yeah, I would, I would imagine so. Um, although, again, I'm, I guess either can... Can adapt, but I suspect you avoid disrupting the defence um, as much as possible by not bringing in an, a different centre back and then switching your centre backs over. Um, you probably maintain a little bit of con- continuity by keeping Stroik on the left hand side. I thought it was quite no- notable that um, 
Charlie Creswell was out of the squad on Wednesday. That um, the players coming back and Cooper being fit again meant that there was no place for him in the twenty. And I still do wonder with Creswell and Shackleton where this will go as as the season goes on. I mean, Farker clearly really rates Shackleton, and I would, it honestly wouldn't surprise me if he does say to the club, "You need to speak to him about a new contract because he's worth keeping." But I know that Shackleton will be mindful about how much he's actually going to play, and for all that it's. He's spoken about constantly as this great pro and this great kid, brilliant attitude, really good engine, a lot of talent. It it's just forever difficult for him to keep a place, you know, hold down a place. I don't see him getting a game in the centre of midfield, which is surely still where he would love to play, um, ideally. And with Creswell, I mean, we know there's been a lot of interest in Creswell. There was last season. We know I had a good season at, at Millwall. Again, if he's not knocking on the door in the championship or if he's not in the squad in the championship, you can't help feeling that he's going to be another one who's going to start looking elsewhere. You could easily imagine um, Shackleton racking up like 30, 35 appearances this season without even realising he's done it. Yeah, possibly. Um, and moving around from place to place, filling in um, when he needs to, um, which might be enough for him. Whereas with Creswell, I, I don't know how many appearances you'd imagine him making, but it, if Rodon's fit and strikes in the team and Cooper's there... Um, and everything else, just as I say, looking at the bench on Wednesday, it did suddenly make you think, despite everything, and despite the fact that Creswell is a very good player, England under-21 international, had a good season in this division at Millwall, he just seems to be down the pecking order, which is not ideal for him. How do you feel about this one going into it, Michael? I'm looking forward to seeing Tom Ince. It's been a few years. <laughs> <laughs> the most championshipy <laughs> player I can imagine. He's, he's always there somewhere. I was actually kind of surprised to learn he was at Watford, but it also it makes perfect sense. I do love that when players, but you know, you'd look through a squad and you think, oh, there he is. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't I feel like... Um, I, feel I, like did that, I did that thing with the damage Traore as well last night where um, I looked at the team sheet and I thought, I thought he was at Fulham. Yeah. And then I was like, oh no, there's two. Yeah, yeah. more, more Traore than you realise. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We need a home win, though. I feel like a, a good yeah. home win get, gets the season going a bit as well. I think that's right. I yeah. think that's right. And that would be seven points from this week, which Millwall away, Hull away, Watford the home, really good return. Yeah, it would be a good return, wouldn't it? Um, we shall see then, I guess. We yes. shall see. Um, we'll be back on Monday to debrief that and uh, find out how it all went. Were we right to be quietly optimistic? I said we need a, a good win and say <laughs> we would get one. Yeah. Do, do you think we will, though? It's, it's hard to call, isn't it, at the minute? I, I, yes. go, I, go, I go into all these games at the minute. My mindset generally is, I'm pretty much looking forward to this game. We've got some, lots of good players now. We look like one of the best sides in the division. I've got no reason to be pessimistic just yet. So, you know, just try and enjoy it. I reckon every game this season, you're going to know how it's going to go after about 20 minutes, barring weird things happening, like a road on red car, which completely changes it, or, or some odd decision. Um but it was like that in Millwall. You had the Millwall onslaught, but then Leeds scored and it settled, I felt, by the time they scored. that They started to get the measure of the game. Um, and I think it'll be the same on Saturday. We'll know. I'll, I'll message you bang on 20 minutes and we'll make <laughs> predictions and I bet we can call it from that point. We'll keep the swears out of that message then and we'll, uh, we'll relay it yes, on, why on, not? on Monday's show. Uh, yeah, back with a match ball after the game, um, live streamed on YouTube for RTSB Plus members. And uh, we'll be back with more Phil Hay on Monday. We'll speak to you then. The Square Ball Podcast. 